The Great Turkey Walk by Kathleen Carr. The summary of the book is that in 1860, a somewhat simple-minded 15-year-old boy attempts to herd 1,000 turkeys from Missouri to Denver. Copyrighted in 1998 by Kathleen Carr. Author's Note. In the days before intercontinental railroads, highways, and trucking firms, the only way to get livestock on the hoof, or claw, to market was to walk it. Many have been the tales of great cattle drives. Hardly anyone remembers the great turkey walks, which required just as many heroics. During the 19th century, feathered herds were routinely walked to Boston and other northeastern cities from surrounding farms. These treks, however, rarely covered more distance than 50 miles. The epic journeys took place in the West. In 1863, one enterprising gentleman actually walked a herd of 500 turkeys from Missouri to Denver with only a wagon drawn by mules, the birds, and two boy drovers. Another entrepreneur of the period performed the same feat in reverse, walking a flock from California to the booming Comstock load of Carson City, Nevada, earning enough money to establish a famous cattle fortune. These intrepid pioneers were the inspiration for Simon and his enterprise in this book, The Great Turkey Walk. Okay, and this is a word from Dana yet. Well, it is really true that before the days when people could haul cattle and flocks of turkeys or whatever um, by train or, or trucks, and they just walked them in big flocks, that really did happen. Uh, Simon Green was a fictional character, meaning that it's, he's not really a real character. But it's based on people who did do this. So just keep that in mind as you listen to the book. Chapter 1. I've always been fond of birds, poultry in particular. Maybe that's on account of the fact that Aunt Maybell took to calling me pea-brained fairly early on. That's as in peahen or peafowl. Now, I know for a fact that was meant as an insult, considering the size of most birds' brains. Small. Tiny. Hardly there at all. Trotted off to the school marm instead, first time I heard the epithet. Miss Rogers, she just pulled out her worn copy of Webster's, that's the best dictionary in these United States, and showed me that peafowl were actually peacocks. Well, I strutted around the schoolroom, Peacocks are gorgeous birds, ain't they, Miss Rogers? Miss Rogers smiled. They do make up in elegance what they lack in intelligence, Simon, she answered. Miss Rogers always talked like that. She was an elegant lady all around. Not that I considered myself that elegant, or that I even took particular pains in my appearance. But I was strapping. Anybody could say that for me. Here I was, barely 15, and I already towered over my aunt and uncle and my cousins and schoolmates. And Miss Rogers, too, of course. She wasn't hardly knee-high to a grasshopper anyhow. But I liked her just fine. So it was a sorry day when we closed in on the end of another school year. Miss Rogers asked me to stay after to help her tidy up. I picked up the broom as usual and started in on the floor. Simon? Y yes, ma'am. You may put down the broom. I really wanted to have a private talk with you. Ma'am? She pointed to a spot on the bench facing her desk. I sat, hanging on to the broom. Wasn't sure where to leave it with the sweeping still undone. Simon, she began again. Simon, I grinned. You've got my name down pat, Miss Rogers. <sighs> she sighed. I do indeed, as well I might. 
A frown formed around the edges of her mouth. She toyed with some of that golden hair of hers. Simon, she tried again, this is very hard for me to say, but you realize... Yes, ma'am? You realize you've just completed third grade for the fourth time. Yes, ma'am. It was more of a pleasure than usual. Her brows started in knitting. Be that as it may. Then she took a deep breath and finally let it out. I believe you've plumbed the depths of third grade, Simon. I believe it's time for you to move on. I perked up. That mean I'm finally promoted to fourth? Unfortunately, no. You're already my oldest student, Simon Green. As much as I've enjoyed your companionship, it's time for you to brave the world, to spread your wings. You're kicking me out, Miss Rogers? I'm graduating you, Simon. There's a difference. I scratched my head. It was a fine, full thatch of hair. Not soft and golden like Miss Rogers, though. More like hay at harvesting time. I scratched some more. I hadn't figured on being graduated for another few years easy. If third grade had taken this long, only consider the challenges of fourth and fifth. That didn't even take into account six, which is what the school went up to. I will miss you, Simon. I'll miss your help chopping wood for the stove and your cleaning and fixing everything in sight. And you're so good with the little ones. What do I do next? I broke in. Uncle Lucas and Aunt Maybelle? Well, they're happiest when I'm off to school. Can't you help on the farm? I shrugged. My cousins, they don't take to my messing about with their inheritance. I brightened. But they do say as how I'm a fine mucker. Think there's a future in manure, Miss Rogers? She shook her head. Sadly, I thought. Not everyone appreciates your finer talents, Simon. But I'm certain, she rose from behind her desk, I'm certain there's a place for you in this world. Just think about what you like best, Simon. Think about it, and I'm sure you'll find a solution. Thank you, Miss Rogers. I guessed I was dismissed. I set down the broom for the last time and took off for home. The entire three-mile tramp back I cogitated over Miss Rogers' words. One phrase kept coming back to me. It's time to spread your wings. Spread your wings. A hawk swooped over my head and I followed its flight right over the neighbor's turkey farm. My pea-sized brain lit on that flock of dumb turkeys. I walked closer and they stared at me, gobbling. Hey, Simon. I glanced up. Hey, Mr. Buffy. Your birds are looking fine. Looks could kill. He started in grumbling right off. Everyone knew Mr. Buffy was the biggest grumbler in Missouri. They swelled this year when I wasn't watching. Size of the flock just tripled. That's fine luck, I offered. Not if you ain't got the market. He pulled out a wad of tobacco and bit off a chaw. Here I got all these eating turkeys, eating me out of house and home. You can't sell them off in St. Louis? That's a 50-mile walk, Mr. Buffy kept on griping. And they got turkeys enough. Seems to me, Mr. Buffy, seems to me. What do it seem to you, Simon? 
he spit out a stream of tobacco juice. Them dumb turkeys around him went scrabbling after it. Seems to me if they don't need turkeys here in Missouri, you ought to take them where they are wanted. He humped. Sure and certain I got me all summer to walk a thousand turkeys out west where they's wanted. I scratched my head again. How far out west, Mr. Buffy? Why, some place like to Denver. I was just reading in the papers about Denver. Biggest boom town you ever saw. What with gold littering the very streets like it is. But they ain't got nothing to eat there but beans and bread and coffee three times the day. Turkeys on the hoof would go for five dollars a head out there. What'd they go for hereabouts? Two bits, he spat once more in disgust. I stared at the turkeys again. I ain't got nothing to do all summer, Mr. Buffy. What's that? I said ain't a solitary thing holding me down. I could walk your turkeys to Denver, Mr. Buffy. You, Simon! <laughs> Ah, he laughed. You walk my turkeys to Denver? <laughs> Near a thousand miles. He laughed some more as if I had just made his day. Well, a few insulting words were one thing. Didn't like it when people outright laughed at me, though. I set off for the last mile down the road to home, without a single civil farewell, only now, spreading my wings somehow, kept coming back to turkeys. I forked three big chops onto my plate at dinner that night. Pass the potatoes, Cousin Ned. A mountain of mashed potatoes joined my chops. I drowned it all in thick gravy, shoveled in a bite. Uncle Lucas? Eh? Can't hear you for the mashies, Simon. I swallowed and waited on my next bite, famished though I was. Know that old wagon falling apart behind the barn? What of it? If I was to fix it up, could I have it? Uncle Lucas grunted. Cousins Ned, Homer, Pete, and Marcus stared at me over their own heaping plates, with their beady little eyes. They was probably figuring on what part of their inheritance that old broken-down wagon was. Ain't Maybell at the bottom of the table took an interest, too. What you want with that old wreck, Simon? She asked. I shoveled in another bite, considering. Finally, spit out the news. Got me graduated from school today. Fixing on setting up in business. Their blank looks turned devious, each and every one of them. Aunt Maybelle dabbed her apron at a corner of her eye. You'll be leaving us, Simon, after all these years? God willing, Aunt Maybelle. Uncle Lucas downed a draft of his cider. Supposing you was to fix that old wagon? He stopped. Supposing I was to give it to you out of the kindness of my heart as a sort of inheritance in memory of my dear sister Samantha, God rest her soul, departed these ten long years. Sure is shooting not in memory of her good-for-nothing husband, Samson, Departed, but not to his just rewards, these same long ten years. Ain't Maybelle just had to tack that on. She'd done so with regularity over these aforementioned years. Always made me wonder about the paw I couldn't hardly remember. I laid down a bare bone and set to work on another chop. Just supposing... Uncle Lucas peered at me. What you figure pulling it with? Mules, 
I answered promptly. My four mules that I hand-fed from foals when their mamas give up on them. Well, that started a row. Paul, yelled Cousin Homer, since when's those mules Simon's? Just cause he raised them himself, Ned added, and trained them, Marcus throwed in. Just because they won't do a thing for nobody else, Peter whined. I cleared off the last of my potatoes and gravy and reached for the platter of chops. I'll pay you for them. Stunned silence. Also pay you for the full load of shelled corn I'll be needing. Why, Simon Green, you ain't got a plug nickel to your name, Aunt Maybell finally choked out. Don't now, will by the end of summer. You expect me to let you have them mules and corn on speculation, Simon? Uncle Lucas's piggy eyes spread as wide as they ever got. I laid three more chops on my plate and dribbled the gravy nice and slow. Yep. If you want to be rid of me for good and final. The cousins started in nudging each other around me. Ned finally spoke up. Write out a contract, Paul. Make him sign it nice and legal. Ned snickered. He does know how to sign his name. Should after four years in the third grade. <laughs> the snicker grew into a goofball. Ned finally settled some. Put down about how that there wagon is Simon's complete and full inheritance. And write down the price of the corn and the mules, too. Going rates. Aunt Maybelle got up from the table. How about some pie in honor of Simon's new business? Nary a one of them asked me what that business might be. Out in the barnyard after supper, I stripped to my trousers and doused a bucket of water over my head and shoulders, put on my clean Sunday shirt, and slicked down my hair. Cousin Pete spied my efforts. Simon's got a sweetheart. Simon's got a sweetheart. I didn't deign to make an answer. Just mounted my lead mule Sparky, bareback, and took off down the road to Union. Sooner than later, I got to the schoolhouse and knocked on the door back behind. That's where Miss Rogers lived. She opened the door, a surprised look on her face. Why, Simon... Evening, ma'am. I shuffled from one big foot to the other. All the time, she kept staring at me. You're all spruced up, Simon. What's the occasion? Wondered if I might have a word with you, ma'am. That would be a rare pleasure, even if we only parted this afternoon. She stood aside and waved me into her little room. I hadn't ever been there before, not in all these years of schooling. It was her private territory. Most creatures have one. Mine was beneath that same old wagon I just saved from rotting to death. Many's the summer's night I lay underneath its bed, just content to be away from the house and my cousins, staring at the stars through the gaps in its slats, Wondering if my mamma was up there somewheres keeping an eye on me. Now I spun around slowly, taking in Miss Rogers' territory. I suspicioned it'd be nice, like you. She smiled. Do take a seat, Simon. I'll fix us a cup of tea. There were only two chairs by the tiny table in a corner. I took one of them. Then I tried to figure on what to do with my long legs. They never seemed to get in the way like this in the schoolroom next door. A china cup was set in front of me. On a saucer, there were painted rosebuds all over both. The handle on that cup looked to break in pieces if I was to even touch it with my thick fingers. A matching teapot joined it all atop the lace tablecloth. 
Miss Rogers sat herself down across from me. She arranged her skirts. We'll just let the tea steep a moment, Simon. Yes, ma'am. We waited, both staring at that teapot. Miss Rogers finally reached for it and poured for the both of us. There now, she smiled again. You may begin, Simon. Tea does help to settle nerves, I found. I made for the cup and managed not to disgrace myself. That tea was soothing. The cup skittered back into its saucer. I took a deep breath. It's about spreading my wings, ma'am. I've made a start on it. One eyebrow rose. Already? Yes, ma'am. I've lined up the wagon and the mules and the corn. That leaves but the turkeys. Turkeys? She set down her own cup. Turkeys? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Buffy's got a thousand to spare, and I can have them for a quarter apiece. Then I set my elbows on the table and started explaining about Denver and the turkey walk. Miss Rogers listened all the way through. She really listened. By the time I got to the end, both eyebrows had lifted clear up her forehead. She raised a hand and smoothed them back down again. That is an amazing story, Simon. Ain't a story, I protested. It's pure fact. And I know birds. I'm comfortable with them. It's something I can do, Miss Rogers. Well, she remembered to pick up her cup again. I do believe you could. How can I help? I knew exactly how she could help. That's why I had come. First off, my multiplication weren't ever too strong, but the numbers are nice and round. Wanted you to check them for me. I pulled out a scrap of paper. See here, 1,000 turkeys times 25 cents. I glanced across to her. Seems to me that'd make $250. Miss Rogers, she didn't even need to glance at my scrap. She just beamed. You remembered about adding the zeros and even moving the decimal point. I'm so proud of you, Simon. Thank you, ma'am. That decimal point had given me a few bad moments, but now came the really hard part. I tried to figure out what to do with my hands since they seemed to get in the way of conversing. I finally sat on them. That just leaves me with finding $250 to buy Mr. Buffy's flock. What I need is a partner, Miss Rogers. Come Denver, that partner's money would increase, like loaves and fishes. Miss Rogers' eyebrows, they rose some more. Sky high. Sparky and me. We trotted back home that night in clouds of glory. Miss Rogers had said it was the most interesting business proposition she had ever heard, especially coming from someone generally considered pea-brained. We had an appointment to meet at the town bank in the morning. Miss Rogers was going to invest her life savings from teaching in my turkey walk. Of course, that meant I had to succeed. The saddest thing I could think of was having Miss Rogers lose her life savings. Back at the farm, I unbridled Sparky and gave him a rub. Then I stroked the fine velvet on his long ears. You and me are going to have ourselves a time, I murmured to him. You and me and your brothers, we're going to have a good long walk. We're going to see the world, and we're going to make something of ourselves. After Sparky brayed his approval, I grabbed a saddle blanket and spread it under my wagon. Instead of counting the stars, I lay there figuring on how to fix it up strong. 
really strong. End of chapter one.